On the evening and the morning of the third day, the seas were gathered. On the fourth day came the wheel of the seasons. On the fifth, eagles flew. And on the sixth, woman and man were given breath. Yet nowhere in all the stories of creation is it told when bright star spilled her sack of storms. Nowhere is it told when rivers were made. In Montana, where there are more than 9,000 rivers and streams, there are three as wild and free and alive as any on earth. The Yellowstone, the Madison, the Big Hole. They flow from magic places with names like Bitterroot, Firehole, and Beartooth, through old stone growing older. Yet unlike mountains, rivers never age. They are new each moment, in constant creation, each riffle, each wandering mile, a life just born. Maybe that's why our creation myths don't mention rivers. It's a process incomplete, a half-told tale. Rivers don't grow old, but rivers can die. Their life stolen away by pollution and ignorance, greed or indifference. It's a story too often told. Yet, these three rivers remain natural treasures. The Yellowstone, the Madison, and the Big Hole survive. Three of the finest wild trout streams in the world, and they survive. They survive because a lot of people made up their minds that the loss of these rivers would be unthinkable. And for each of these rivers, someone emerged to represent the conservation effort. Three men, each with a lifetime focused on one river, fishing its bounty, singing its praises, conserving its resources, defending it from harm. George Grant's love affair with the Big Hole River has endured for nearly 70 years. During the Great Depression, George lost his job with the railroad and he went fishing. It was a fishing trip that would last a lifetime. George has logged more fly fishing hours on the Big Hole than any soul living or departed. He claims the river is in his blood and he is a hopeless addict. George Grant and the Big Hole. It's difficult to think of one without thinking of the other. I've always thought that if a person was to create a wild trout stream, if such a thing had been possible, the Big Hole River would serve as a model. It's the type of stream that meanders. Each run or riffle is different. No two of them ever seem to be the same. The solitude that transports the mind to a world devoid of care and worry. The soothing effect of running water that lulls the senses into a state of contentment. The warm sun, the cooling breeze, and the gentle rain. Few men have ever been so rich. The free-flowing Big Hole River wanders from its headwaters in the Bitterroot Range some 150 miles in a lazy, easterly arc. It passes the community of wisdom and past where it's joined by the Wise River. It flows past Maiden Rock, to its confluence with the Beaverhead River. When Lewis and Clark came this way, they named the stream Wisdom River, but the name was never used. 
The Nez Perce had long before called these deep valleys big holes, and that's the name that stuck. It's a name known and revered by fishermen throughout the world. An angler's paradise. An angler spends a day on the big hole. It's a scene that's multiplied 66,000 times each year. They come for the beauty of the river's setting. They come to celebrate earth and cloud and the treble melody of stream on stone. But most of all, they come for an encounter an encounter with wild trout, cutthroat, rainbow, brook, grayling, and brown. And in early summer, the wild trout, among nature's most noble creations, appear to behave in a most ignoble manner as they gorge themselves on what might seem the least of nature's gifts. The drab, the inelegant, Terranosis californica, the salmon fly. Each year in May and June, the female salmon fly lays her eggs. The eggs sink beneath the water and remain for 10 to 11 months. When the egg hatches, the wingless creatures remain underwater, feeding on algae. Then, in their fourth year, they crawl from the depths to the shoreline shallows and then into the moonlight and the bushes and the trees along the bank. The adult salmon fly splits its skeletal case to emerge and mate. The females will drop into the water to lay their eggs once again. Constant rebirth and renewal. Time and the river ever turning. George Grant has spent his years seeking to outwit the big holes wild trout through his interpretation of nature. He has developed the tying of flies to a high art and his flies are prized by collectors in the same way many others collect paintings or first edition books. Through the sale of his hand-tied flies, George has raised more than $50,000 dollars dedicated to the conservation of the Big Hole River. Not long ago, George wrote about the river and the wild Big Hole trout. I have always had an inordinate amount of admiration and respect for wild trout, a deep inner feeling that borders on reverence. And the lure of the trout kept me everlastingly enthralled. I am indebted to a noble creature that has enriched my life. It takes time to learn to enjoy the sights, the scents, and the sounds of a trout stream. It is best to fish alone, to meander like the stream. It is not a place for loud conversation, competition, or concern about meeting a deadline. The angler's pace is leisurely, and there is time to appreciate the beauty of his surroundings. To George Grant, trout fishing on the Big Hole is an experience bordering on prayer, a kind of worship in the temple of nature. But for others, 
The experience to be had on Montana's western rivers is not so much prayer, but carnival. Each year, when the salmon flies hatch on western Montana rivers, a rolling riot of pickups and Mercedes, good old boys and millionaires, anglers from across town and from across the planet, all vie with each other and fate to be at the right place, at the right time, at the same time. It seems every angler in the world descends upon the river. In late June, 100 boats will pass under the Melrose Bridge in a single day. The salmon fly hatch is a banquet of tall, saloon-told tales, bizarre philosophies and strategies, loony characters casting sofa pillows and fluttering stones and other more outlandish gear into those pools and riffles where wild trout are devouring live salmon flies and an occasional work of art from the workbench of George Grant. Then, in a few days, the crazy caravans of fishermen depart. And the river is quiet again. It's almost as if the hatch were a dream. A madcap interlude in the orderly rhythms of a very uncommon river. And then, the big hole is left to men like George Grant. People who love to fish, not because it's easy, but because it's not. The Madison River is little more than 100 miles long, and it's remarkable a river so small would have a reputation so large. Yet the beguiling beauty of this magic stream and the abundance of wild trout it holds are known and praised throughout the world. The Madison rises from the junction of the Firehole and Gibbon Rivers in Yellowstone National Park. The Upper Madison is broad and rapid and shallow, what some have called a 50-mile riffle. The river flows through groves of willow and great wide benches of grass sculpted by ancient ice and thyme. And then the river braids and flows through islands of cottonwood. To the east rise the towering peaks of the Madison Range, and to the west sweep the forested slopes of the gravelly mountains. And then makes a fist and thunders through Bear Trap Canyon. then relaxes to broaden and soften and ease its way along the final 30 miles of its journey to the confluence of the Gallatin and the Jefferson at the Missouri headwaters. Bud Lilly has been a fishing guide on the Madison River for over 35 years. As an outfitter and former owner of a fly shop, Bud has led the fight to conserve the incomparable resources of the Madison. Each year, clients from Switzerland, France, Germany, Japan, and many other countries came to his fly shop for advice on strategy and gear. Bud Lilly remembers. He remembers techniques and the gear he used in his early years on the river. We weren't concerned with method. We used worms and sucker meat and bullheads. We screened the rivers for what at that time we called devil scratchers. I used a fly rod, but we were primarily bait fishermen. Any of the surplus fish that we caught, uh, I would get on my bicycle and ride all over Manhattan, little town where I grew up, and try to give them away to our friends. And my dad would say, all right now, buddy, you could take these and deliver them to certain houses around town. And if I had a real busy summer, I'd get so people wouldn't answer the door. I couldn't give any of the fish away. They'd seen me coming often enough, so I'd have to find new territory. In Bud Lilly's tackle shop, 
an angler could find a huge array of equipment and expertise designed for the catching of trout. Yet Bud Lilly, both fisherman and man, is not overly impressed with either technology or expert opinion. I don't fuss over the kind of uh, flies that I'm going to use as long as I think that it's close and if it works and if it catches fish. If you get so involved and so intense on the equipment, then I think that you're missing, missing the overall real joy and experience of being on a trout stream in great surroundings with all the pluses that uh, are provided by the wildlife and the birds and the clearness of this western mountain air. I always have the same feeling of exhilaration that, boy, I'm, I've got a great day ahead of me. What an opportunity. Uh, how fortunate I am, how lucky I am just to be here. On the evening and the morning of the fifth day, life began to move beneath the waters. Raven touched the river with his wing. One thousand or more eggs drifted through a cloud of sperm onto a quiet gravel bed. Covered and then left to the care of the stream. With this act of creation begins the odyssey of Montana's wild trout. is an odyssey more dangerous by far than any Ulysses faced. And because of the perils the wild trout encounters, only the strongest of the species survive. If not destroyed by other fish or kingfishers or blue herons or otters or bear, then there is that legendary hunter constantly watching from the summit of the winds. Wild trout escapes the eagle. There is an even more dangerous predator waiting round the bend. But Lily doesn't know exactly when his philosophy began to change. Maybe it was watching the courage of a trout fighting for life in the talons of an eagle that rose high above the river. So I began releasing my fish, and the more I released them, the more I found that that was enjoyable. The uh, catching release of the fish also, I think, gives uh, people the opportunity to look around themselves and see what else is there to involved in this sport besides just the query, just catching the fish, going for size or going for numbers, whatever, in order to impress someone besides yourself. That people uh, begin to acknowledge that their greatest pleasures came within themselves. Catch and release is both a personal philosophy and a common sense conservation strategy. Throughout the years, Bud Lilly has campaigned for special regulations, tackle restrictions, and bag limits to promote wild trout. But it is catch and release which captures the spirit of the growing movement to preserve both trout and their free-flowing rivers. When Raven first created the earth, the rivers ran both ways, upstream on one side, downstream on the other. 
But this made movement on the river too easy for the people because they could move freely in both directions without paddling. And that's why Raven changed the flow of rivers, so they moved in one direction only. Among all the free-flowing rivers that Raven made, few fire the imagination as does the Yellowstone. For all its 678 miles, this wild river runs free. There are no major dams to bar the journey from its headwaters in Yellowstone National Park to the Missouri. That the Yellowstone has never been conquered, that its flow has remained unencumbered since Raven altered creation, is certainly due to the efforts of many. But one stands above the rest. Dan Bailey. A name synonymous with the Yellowstone. A college professor from the East who wanted to go trout fishing in western rivers. His car broke down on the Yellowstone and that's where he stayed and went fishing for decades till he died. Charles Waterman, author of Mist on the River, Remembrances of Dan Bailey, was his friend. Dan Bailey came here to go trout fishing. That was all he wanted to do. His ambition was come out here and spend his time fishing for trout and uh, tying enough flies to keep it going. And the object he was to fish for trout. Well, uh, Dan... <laughs> Dan had a background as an educator, you know. He'd been a teacher, and he had uh, that uh, rapport with children. And when a kid came in for something, whether it was important or not, Dan would drop whatever he was doing. When a barefoot boy would come in and want a, uh, some sinkers or a little bit of line, or Dan would go back in the back boy, and he might leave some fellow standing near at the counter with $100 bills in his pocket. And when Dan finally came out of the boy, the boy would be grinning. He'd have his line and his sinkers, and Dan might fall him to the front door and forget the uh, fellow that he had uh, lined up there at the counter and had his hand on his billfold. He was uncompromising in his attitudes about conserving the rivers. And Dan Bailey, although he was one of the best liked people in Montana and the West, Dan Bailey also had some uh, pretty uh, serious enemies and he got through that. If you took the wrong side on the dam issue, or if you said something that implied that you didn't agree with the uncompromising conservation angle on the river business, you immediately had trouble with Dan Bailey. Although a small, quiet, modest man, Dan Bailey had an enormous presence in the world of western rivers. All he wanted to do was go fishing. And if that meant fighting dam builders, or polluters, or vandals, that was a part of the trip. Well, we never know just what uh, things would have been like without a conservationist. Uh, the conservationist doesn't build anything that you see. Generally, he's engaged in saving something that we all want. And that's the way Dan Bailey was. We uh, don't know what the situation would have been if he had never been here. But I always think about his influence on the dam. It's possible that if it uh, hadn't been for Dan Bailey, we might have had the uh, Yellowstone River dammed. Uh, there were a lot of other people against it too, but uh, he was a ringleader in that in a quiet way. The conservationist, Aldo Leopold, wrote about the concept of the round river. He described it as a river that flows into itself in a never-ending circuit. A 
a stream of energy embracing land and water and sentient life in an ongoing harmonic pattern. There are very few round rivers left in the world. Very few rivers that are as alive today as they were when Bright Star and Raven were first imagined. The Big Hole, the Madison, the Yellowstone. These three rivers will remain alive as long as we remember the legacy left to us by these three conservationists. It is still possible to pursue the autumn brown trout on George Grant's Big Hole when the river is awash with the sound of solitude and the trout is wary and cautious and strong. We can still follow Bud Lilly's path along the Madison and see a big fish take a fly off the surface while throwing spray you can see for 200 yards and then gently with reverence let that big fish go. It is still possible to wade into the Yellowstone like Dan Bailey did, bouncing along on tiptoe, dancing from boulder to boulder, the water just lapping the tops of his waders. But just as important, it still will be possible to go to these beautiful places and not fish. Simply to escape the noise, escape the crowds, escape the hurry of our contemporary life, if just for a little while. To simply be in these wild and still natural provinces is to touch something eternal. It's to be a part of a universal dance where the music lasts forever.